is no accident podcast i'm your host maritza pez today's guest is a speech scientist and phonetic professor dr grenham a writer and a speaker for social change and education originally from canada dr isabel grenham is a former associate professor at the university of tokyo in japan specializing in phonetics and language acquisition. She recently retired from, from her position at the university to work as an independent writer, public speaker, and consultant. Building on her professional background and unique personal experiences, living in seven different cultures, she likes to talk about the biodiversity of humans, what's like to be an immigrant and are intercultural marriages really more difficult and much more. She is also an educational consultant for schools and an intercultural consultant for public and private organizations. Dr. Grenon, welcome. It is an honor to have you here with us today. Thank you for having me, Maiza. I'm really happy to be here. I'm very excited about this conversation, but before we get to it, I would like to start with our theme question. Thurston Brennan, Isabel, what is your accent and why is not an accident? <laughs> um, well, if you ask uh, normally well, around the world, people will say that uh, they think I'm American. So they think I have an American accent. Uh, but in America, uh, they think I have a Canadian accent. And in Canada, they just think I don't have the right accent. Uh, <laughs> that's because I'm originally a French Canadian. So I learned English as an adult after I was 20 years old. I studied really hard. But um, the thing is that now my life has been in English for work, at home, I in most social situations, always in English. And I write in English. and my English is, I think, better than my French now. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, awesome. Uh, yeah. As I mean, you have lived in seven different cultures. What different, which ones are those? Uh, well, my first experience was I went to Denmark. And by living in different culture, I don't mean uh, traveling. I traveled to a dozen countries or more. But for living, like really spending time renting, uh, cooking, and, you know, do all your whole stuff. Uh, so the first time I was 26, I went to Denmark for half a year to study an exchange student. And then, um, and, and then I, uh, uh, I went to the U.S. for four months for my master's uh, research uh, project. And then I moved to English part of Canada, which is actually quite different than French, in my opinion. At least the two part I've been coming uh, out where I'm from and the part I moved to were really, really different for me. And then okay. um, I moved to Japan and for 13 years I lived there. And at some time, at some point I went to Turkey on my sabbatical leave for half a year. And now I moved again and now I'm living in Mauritius, a small island on the, uh, in Africa, but it's, it's kind of the, East Coast near Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. That's where I live now. Oh, how interesting. Like um, when we first talk and you say Mauritius, I'm like, oh, like, like, like the Mauritius, like the Madagascar movie. I think that they, um, in the documentary also about Africa, they name it. And I'm like, that is very interesting. Um, and Probably one of the questions that pops up right now in my head is um, how it is to live in Mauritius, Africa? 
Well, I just arrived last year and it's been uh, quite uh, hectic and a little difficult to settle in. So they call it, they, they sell it as the paradise on earth. Uh, maybe for traveling is good, but living is quite a different story. Um, you know, we haven't been really lucky. So we're still, I think, going through culture shock a little bit. <laughs> so, so it's a little hard to adapt. Uh, especially coming from Japan, you know, Japan is very organized. Uh, everybody's on time, as you can imagine, in a small island country like Mauritius. Uh, it's hard to expect anybody to be on time. Or you go to the store, I say, okay, do you have this? Oh, we'll call you back. They never do. <laughs> 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 so it's a little, it's a little, it's another, it's another way of living, and, and we're getting used to it slowly. But it's very yeah. different from going from Japan that, you know, everybody's on time, everything is done. And yeah. so it's, I did like that about Japan. So it's a little hard for me, but at the same time, you know, in Japan, you also have the lifestyle was really demanding, fast paced. You don't have really much time with your family, work, work. I was working six, seven days a week, uh, usually all year round. I had took maybe a, a week or two of real vacation per year. And I often work late until like 10 p.m. Um, so here is, well, so here I'm self-employed. So it's a little different <laughs> for sure. But uh, yeah, the lifestyle people are much more relaxed here, which is nice. And um, my kids enjoy it, actually. My kids, they are the one who adapted the most, not because they're young. I think because some kids have a really hard time adapting to a new culture. So I've heard some other parents who moved here and their children had a really hard time the first year or two. My kids, not so much. I think because they're a bit like me, they're very adventurous. They're very, uh, they're very happy to try new things. They're really excited about the new. So, and they love their new school, which is quite different system than in Japan as well. I, know. I like that. Um, and then obviously what you were saying, there is a cultural shock difference because uh, Japan is, it's kind of like a metropoly, right? Tokyo is a metropoly. And then you're moving to um, more laid back environment. <laughs> and, I, and I'm thinking because I'm from Colombia and I'm thinking, yeah, it will be like moving from the capital to one of the little towns where you are like, expecting things to happen right away and they take days or weeks to happen and they are okay with everything oh, it's fun it's just the way things are here <laughs> i yeah, imagine exactly, that right? <laughs> so yeah, but I don't, I don't think it's necessarily people like it because i see local people they don't necessarily uh, I, there's actually a movement of many people trying to move to canada so if i say i'm canadian they're like oh <laughs> <laughs> but uh so i feel there's um yeah i mean but i was talking to a lady the other day and she said oh you know mauritius is not so good for when we live here you know it's i said you know there's nobody who complain more about the culture than local people who local are born people. into it <laughs> <laughs> so yes, yes. i think that every culture has good points and bad points and um and yeah, it depends also your personality too, I feel. Like for me, I, I know many people who had a really hard time in Japan. They don't like this kind of strict rules and things. And me too, at some point, it was too much. But at the beginning, I really loved it. <laughs> so structured, so organized, so clean. Um, so that fit, that was a good fit with my personality. And also in a, a small thing, but, you know, in, in, uh, in Canada or in English word, they would... You meet a new pe person you've never met, and they will shake your hand, right? Mm. Or uh, in French, they will kiss two or three times. <laughs> I don't remember. Yes. And then, and then, or some people would just hug you. And I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it in Japan because in Japan they don't touch you, right? They just greet and oh hi, and, and I like that. No, I don't have to kiss people I don't know. <laughs> I don't have to hug them or shake their hands. Uh, but when the Japanese people have been to America and they learn about American culture, then they feel they have to show me they know and they want to shake my hand. <laughs> so I'm like, 
oh no, I, I, I love Japan because I don't have to do that. And of course, I don't tell them that. I will shake their hand politely because, you know, they're trying to make an effort to reach to me. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but the thing is that we assume that because people are from one culture and that this is a cultural behavior that everybody will do it. It's not the case. I, I know some American who hate that as much as I do <laughs> to shake hands to stranger. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, in 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 essence, culture is not only the place where we come from. Is is um, not the geo place where we come from? Like culture is also the way you grow up. Is is the way you are, is, is what I called your accent, is who you are inside and what you like or dislike and the things that you learn to do and the, the, the way you learn how to live your life. Correct? That, that is basically yeah. what marks our culture. Yeah, well, yeah, I think that um, uh I seen the other day, uh, I was introducing culture to my students in Japan and they, they, they were dividing culture into two different things, tangible and intangible things. So intangible things are things like, um, tangible things will be something like art, you know, like paintings and things like that. And there will be some intangible things like expectations. Uh, and, and uh, but I think we need to distinguish the difference between culture and the person from that culture. These are two different things and people mix them up that because a culture is like this, that the people from that culture will be like this, like the shaking hands. It's not because I'm Canadian and that it's in the culture to shake hands. That means that I like it. Mm -hmm. And it applies to so many little things. We expect people to behave a certain way. For example, Japanese has the the reputation it's a stereotype but at the same time it's part of the culture to be quiet reserved and humble right i've met japanese people who were not humble i mean some, some people are boisterous maybe in a nice way not necessarily in a bad way but it doesn't mean that all japanese are fit this um culture it's it's i think culture is kind of a, a expectation or pressure from the society and okay. one of the reasons why some people move to another country is because they cannot stand it or like it, right? So I don't like, I love in Japan, like um, the trains are very quiet. You're not supposed to talk in the train. Yes. Right? You don't take your phone and... Ah. Yes. So, and I don't like this aspect in Canada or in the US. People would do that. And I think most, most countries around the world, people will, will talk in the train very loud and it's, it's acceptable. And uh, but in Japan is not acceptable. So it's a social pressure. So in in America, you can have people. I met this. Uh, I was at the uh, University of California in Berkeley, and I was on campus, and it was late. This young lady talking on her phone, and really, I think she was really really sad, and she was crying, and really loud while she walks all on the campus and I could hear everything and you could not imagine that happening in Japan because it will be frowned upon okay. but if a Japanese person go to the US they might start doing it okay because they pick up on, on, on the on the behaviors of other people yes if they don't mind because yeah it's not because there's some the pressure in the culture that people agree with it everybody has different we have our individuality and we have our, our personality. And of course, we're constrained in our culture to behave a certain way. That doesn't define who we are. It's just the culture where we are kind of try to put pressure on our, us to be a certain way. But when we're so many Japanese people I know, they really feel liberated when they go to another culture because they feel they can really be themselves express who they are. They don't have to worry too much about the image they present to society anymore. Okay. So, um, yeah, we have to distinguish. And I think Japanese, but as a well, whole, but I think it's the same. I did love moving to Japan. And even though it was very, very different, and it was very difficult in some ways, I did love it for so long. 
uh, I say 13 years there okay. because there was so many things in Panamanian culture that I absolutely loved and felt comfortable for my personality. Yes. So, Sometimes I say in some ways I, I was more Japanese than a lot of Japanese people I know <laughs> because I really uh, I really agree with some of the things they had. Not everything, of course, but yes. So it, it's more it goes more like with your personality, um, your culture, the behaviors, etc. So um, do you think and um, adapting to cultures is uh, the differences on the cultures is hard or is something that um, with what you say something that you blended into your day to day in an easier way i think i think living with people is hard <laughs> <laughs> no matter the, the culture right so i mean you have to deal with people um and, and um, there is some expectations that are a little different but Overall, I think that it's not the big thing. We, we, when we think about cultural differences, uh, we think often of life-changing things. And it's not, for me, it's not the big things that are more difficult because the big things, you say, you accept them more. There's different laws. Okay, it's different laws, different country. For example, in, in Japan, graffiti is legal, right? And uh, it's, it's, you can go to prison for three years for it. Right? It's, it's, the, it's very harsh, the punishment. Um, but it's the little things of day-to-day -day life that's really hard. Like um, when I was in Denmark the first time, I was shocked. That, that shocked me. I said, well, you know, this, Denmark is not so difficult. The, it's not so different, the culture, than Canadian. Because um, the English is, uh, the Danish is, I thought, will be easy to learn, which turned out this was not true at all. And um, but the first day, I, the first time I went to Denmark, and I tried to buy milk. That's easy, right? Yes. <laughs> you expect we'll go to the shop, we'll find the milk, you will pay, and you get out. No, I stayed like staring ten minutes <laughs> <laughs> at the shelf, and what I realized because I wanted my two percent milk. I love two percent. Yes. So first of all. I couldn't figure out which one was the milk because <laughs> everything is carton. The yogurt is in carton. The milk is in carton. The, it all looks the same and it's all in the same shelf. They have egg nods in there and they have some kind of sour yogurt. I don't know. So, so they had like very different types. And I look at all of this and I cannot figure out which one is the milk, let alone which one is 2% fat. So I had to, <laughs> so I was really embarrassed. And I had to ask somebody, I'm sorry, can you help me? <laughs> Which one is the milk? And it's very frustrating because you will think that this should have caught, you should have been a, in and out, right? You should be able to take it and leave. But, and you say, well, milk is milk. Yeah, when it's your glass, maybe it's obvious, but the way people packages, the way it's uh, even sometimes different product. I was trying to find here in Mauritius cornstash, cornstarch, sorry, cornstarch. And I've been like three grocery store trying to find the corn. <laughs> and then I realized, okay, maybe there's something else. So I had to go online, like a sauce thickener. And here they use oats. Uh -huh. and, yeah. So, uh, and apparently it's better. So, but you had to know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's little things like that. But it's, you lose so much of your time figuring out because the package might look different. The name might be look different. And in Denmark, there's no 2% uh, fat milk. Apparently, there's uh, in Japan either. So it's like low, like 1.5% or 3.25. So you don't have oh. So you cannot necessarily find the same thing as you're used to. And also, it may be packaged differently. Just the ground meat, I had a hard time in, in, um, in Denmark because, uh, you know, in North America, they put coloring. I don't know if they still do it. I lived there for a long time, but they used to color the beef red so that you could distinguish it easily from the pork. So the pork will be more pale and the beef will be more bright red. Yes. In Denmark, they don't. <laughs> oh. So it looks the same color. <laughs> and 
the name, of course, on it, it was not obvious. Is uh, uh, now I know about it. Is uh, Vinakud. Vinakud is pork, and beef is oxakud. I think. Like, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry, <if I'm laughs> but but by the name, and sometimes they mix it together as well. So it's very hard to to. Uh, it was hard for me. I couldn't figure out which one was which. And <laughs> again, it's the little things. Uh, so the grocery is often something that's very difficult for me, especially if it's a different language because of this and it's very frustrating and you know you feel like an idiot <laughs> <laughs> yes i yeah. remember yeah i remember when i moved to, i think that food is one of the principal issues that everybody has when they move to a different country to a different culture when i moved here it was the same thing it was um we have milk and we have milk without lactose and we have soy milk or like plant-based milk in Colombia. So uh, now we Americanize more, but 25 years ago when I moved here, I just had like three, four types of milk and they were very different one from another. And going to your to, to, to what you were saying, when I went to the grocery store, I went in and I'm like, there's a lot of choices. <laughs> it's too many oh, chances. <laughs> so yeah, you, you end up the like, arrow, the the row of cereals in in America, yes. right? You have the whole row, like oh, this is nice. <laughs> in Japan, I had like two bread, two two types, you know, and yes. and the milk, you know, talking about the milk again. You know, in Canada, we have the milk in plastic bag, right? Yes. I mean, you have the yes. it's actually a bag, right? And you put it on. And uh, but here in Mauritius, I would have never find the milk myself. It's not fresh. It's uh, it's a kind of a. Uh, it's on the shelf. It's oh. not in the fridge. It's on the shelf. It's a uh, uh. It's kind of preserved, right? But yeah. it's not like for me the preserved milk in Canada is kind of a can, and it it, it tastes horrible if you try to drink it. But here, no, actually, it's quite depending on the brand, of course. But uh, there's some really good organic, like uh, bio biology uh, milk, and uh, yeah. So, but you have to know that like, you, yes. you cannot you cannot find the the milk in the fridge here. Like, yes, what? you need a local a person to help you uh, figure this out. Yes, I remember those things. Like corn starch, find, finding corn starch here. Uh, I didn't know because in Colombia we call it something else. Uh, so then we found out, ah, it's corn starch. Um, so there, there are many different things, little teeny things that people don't realize when you move to another country with a different culture that you have to actually adapt to. And, um, and it's not... Not because you're an idiot, like you were saying, it's just simply because you don't know. You don't know and you need to learn, right? But um, talking about the cultures, do you think that mo being in different cultures in seven different places um, has shaped you differently or has done um, any kind of change in and shape you different and make you look at the world in a different way now? Certainly, I think so. Um, I don't, you know, when uh, when I was in Japan, people will often ask me, oh, uh, when are you going back home? And, and sometimes I answer, yes, well, my home is in Yokohama. So yeah, I'm going back there tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but what they meant when they say back home or do you miss home, they always think about Canada, right? Because that's where I was born, but from now I realize actually recently that I don't think there's any country that I feel like home. For me, home has become something completely different. It's not a, a place; it's a concept. It's a concept of feeling at home, and for me, being home is being with my husband, children, and my cat. This is home. No matter mm -hmm. where it is in the world, this is my home. 
And um, so, I, yeah, I don't feel I identify with one. I'm very proud to be French Canadian. I will tell everybody I'm French Canadian originally. But at the same time, I I don't feel, <laughs> hard to say, but I don't feel Canadian or French Canadian. I feel like, I feel it doesn't matter. <laughs> yes. I feel like it doesn't matter. I'm who I am. And I put a little bit of things of all the culture I lived in something I really appreciate by this and I appreciate from this culture, this culture, and all those little things that I picked up from different culture, whether it's recipe, I have recipes from all the countries that I've lived to, and, uh, but also who I am. Yeah, I guess, oh, I like people are like this, or I like people are doing like this. So I, I started to do that. So I don't feel like I'm just one culture. I just feel I'm, I've become myself and I've become, I think the best of myself by finding the best of who I am by being exposed to other cu culture. Yes, exactly. And I, I will think that it makes you more diverse in the way of thinking. Um, I, do you think that it makes you more diverse on the way of thinking about the world and the different people from different places? Yeah, I, I cannot talk, but I think for most people, it makes you more uh, open-minded diversity, maybe less judgmental. And it's not necessarily in a bad, I mean, I'm, I don't want to criticize people, but when I was in Canada, I lived just the one way. When I went to Denmark, and I think a lot of people, when they move, they go to a new country for the first time, they see things that are different than what they're used to. And they say, oh, why are they doing this like this? In my country, we do it like this. It's much better in my country. But that's how people think when they are in their own country. Everything else from other countries is not as good as what they do. But by traveling a lot and living in different cu culture, I realized that, you know what? There's no best way. There's just a way you prefer. <laughs> yes. Of course, there's a way I prefer. But And everything makes sense. So when you start to look, understand the culture, um, everything is built around you know, expectations and how the culture is built and how everything is organized. And you cannot just change one thing, everything else will fall apart. Like Japan has a very hierarchical structure, society, and it, it sometimes is, is, I feel it's too much. <laughs> yes. Because this hierarchy is really high. But at the same time, I think that's partly why the, the customer service is so excellent. <laughs> Is because of this idea of the customer is um, we have to serve the customer, and this idea of a difference in in social class. So you're just you you're serving the customer, as opposed to equalitarian means that the service is really really exceptional. Yes. <laughs> and as a as a customer, when you go as a tourist, and people are really or even sometimes you go to um, uh, where well, you live there. And you know it's not it's not always a hundred percent, but usually you go at uh, some nice restaurants. Like the service will be impeccable. They will, yeah. you know, they will do everything they can. So it, so you cannot just change one thing. It's gonna affect the good part too. So you have to be ready <laughs> to maybe compromise the good part to change something in the culture. Yes. So and you you know, you you remind me of something very important. And um, I live uh, near the theme parks near Disney. And when you live near a place where there are so many people from all over the world coming, um, you get used to certain customer service, <laughs> like an elite, kind of like an elite kind of customer service, VIP. Uh, people are extremely nice around, you know, around the, the theme parks and around uh, that area of the hotels and all that. People are extremely nice, um, very good customer service. And then you move for three or even two, not two hours, but probably three, four hours away from that area. And the customer service is not as good. And you kind of like me, oh my goodness, the customer service in this other place was phenomenal. Here it's like I'm begging for, for service. <laughs> I am not entitled to be served. So I believe that 
yes when you are exposed to more and you like um instantly do it is easier but then let's move to something t talking about easier um let's move to something more uh deep and into what you know the best and is uh, the part of linguistics with the you know like we're trying to make the world to to only speak a few languages not all of the languages that we have and we are already losing many languages so wouldn't there be easier to have the world speak only one language and tell me your opinion on this all right well before i answer that question i think we need to understand something in perspective and i have a little quiz for you okay 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 so i uh, share with you do you see it yes i can see it okay so uh so this is by the way this is my son when he was learning um and, and this is uh isn't it interesting example to show how parents we don't really teach our kids <laughs> language <laughs> we think we do but we really don't uh they pick it up at their own pace and this is uh, i'm trying to teach my son how to pronounce hippopotamus right? okay I'm trying, I'm trying. So just a little bit at a time. He oh he got it, but but then no, it, he did. <laughs> you try to break it down and they have it and then they recombine it's like yeah so yeah. but so when so babies start to learn language so i think the first thing we need to understand is how we learn language right yes. and the first thing is when are human babies ready to start learning their first language oh, so when oh. are they like how they're either some part of their body or their brain is ready to learn language so according to what people I, my my answer will be from birth because we're always talking to the babies mm -hmm. um but i think that the majority of people will say 12 18 months but i think that my answer will be from birth yes you are correct ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so yeah, from birth, right? And that's because, um, and that's interesting because a baby's ears are already in the womb, right? So they yes. can pick up in the womb. Um, they cannot pick up the sounds, but they can pick up actually from birth. Usually babies have been found to be able to distinguish at least the, the voice of their own mother from other women's voice. Yes. Um, and from zero, they're, they're starting to pick up we call it statistics of the sound of the language. Of course, they don't speak, but we have to, uh, by six months of age, a uh, baby can distinguish the vowels of their native language. Yes. And by the end of the first year, they already specialize to distinguish the sound, the consonants, consonants, sorry, of their, yes. their native language or the language they are exposed to. Now, when you have, like my son, we're bilingual. So, and actually the first one I was, uh, teaching French, English, and Japanese the first year, and um, so and he could by eighteen months he could speak. Uh, he could produce about a hundred words in three different languages. Right? Oh wow! Yeah, it was uh, the the, uh, the second one. I don't know why it it I, almost <laughs> two years. He, I think he didn't even have a hundred words like two years old. <laughs> so uh, yeah, every every kid is different, right? Yeah. So let's go to the next question. Uh, okay. So the, the, the fascinating part about studying language, uh, a human language, is to understand who we are humans, right? Language, human language is unique to human language, and it's what makes us human. But when did humans start to use language? That's hard to know, but... Yeah, I will like say, 
I will say, no, this is funny because I've been listening to a um, couple of videos about evolution and everything. And if my memory does not um, fail me, I will say is C. B or C, one of the two. All right. Well, actually, researchers don't actually agree on an exact timeline. Yeah. But it seems to be between 100,000 years ago and 2 million years ago. Wow. So depending on maybe what you define as language and their guess. It's a guess, right? Because you don't you yes. look at the, uh, the skeletons and also the tools and, and you how know, do you try to make yeah. Yeah. This this part is what tells you whether we had phonetics or not, right? The, well, the actually, you know. it's interesting because our mouth is made in a way that nothing, we don't have any organs specifically for language. All the other organs, the tongue, we use it for swallowing, the teeth for chewing, the, the lips for closing the mouth so that we don't breathe flies. <laughs> 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 And you have the throat to push things uh, in. So actually, all the and the nose, you you also use nose for nasal sounds like mm, mm, but uh -huh, we use it for breathing too. So there's not actually any organ unique to language. Mm -hmm. So you cannot really know just by the mouth, uh, unless yeah, so it's hard to know. So I think the the using more look at the tools and say okay, if to make some kind of tools or some things you need to be able to communicate to organize and to make this happen so okay. i think that's some of the researcher goes that way I, i'm not a, okay. a specialist in the historical linguistics so yes I, yes but it's what i read okay and but now this week we have record right so when was the first writing system invented so this week we have a proof we have a, the tablets um yes. so when do you think that is i will say the 15,000 years ago? Yes. It, it's actually 5,000. Yeah. So if you compare the spoken language versus the written language, the written language is very recent. Right? So you can okay. say that maybe the 2 million years ago, maybe we start talking, like having some sort of language, mm -hmm. and then we start to write it down <laughs> only 5,000 <laughs> years ago. So, wow. Uh, and most of the recording we have about our language evolution dates from 5,000 years ago because we didn't have any writing system before, right? Okay. And then, so how many languages are spoken in the world today? Um, maybe I can show you a little video and you okay. can guess which language it is. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. It has to be Japanese. I said it. I said it. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, it's Japanese. So okay. Japanese has those really cute words like me for eyes, te for hand, ke for hair. Um. So uh, uh So that's my other son <laughs> when he was a baby. So this is the one who was really talkative and learned a lot of. Like, he was very like this is maybe about one year old or about twelve, Aww. fourteen months. So he was pretty good. He learned a lot of words. So oh. how many languages? So there's many languages are spoken in the world today, but I'm yes. not sure people understand how many that is. So let's see um, how many oh. languages are, are think, still spoken. I think yeah. 4,000. Let's say 4,000. 4,000? Yeah. Actually, it's, oops, oops, sorry. it's uh, a little more. 7,000. Ah, almost. <laughs> 7,000, yeah. Oh, about 7,000 uh, languages spoken today that we know. Um, and last, uh, so how many written? <laughs> so not all languages are written in the world. No. I mean, oh, oops, not, not, not answer A. <laughs> not answer A, yeah. <laughs> um, I will say um, 
a little more, uh, the language written. No, it, it, I will say the. Yes, it's a, the, the language that I have a writing system. Yes. So English has a writing system, French, Japanese, you know. Yes. And, but some languages are only spoken. They don't have a writing system yet. So actually, uh, it's a bit Six. more than half. I was going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> so a bit, a little, a little more than half. About 60% of the world languages are written and some we're trying to, uh, um, so to preserve a language, one of the, the way is to write it, right? So uh, now we can record it too, but um, so like in, in language rev revitalization in North America, so a lot of effort is made into having a writing system, recordings, so that the language can as, at least be preserved in archive, but, hope, um, but not just for that, not just for archive, but also because you can teach it to the younger one. Mm -hmm. So once you have analyzed the language, you can teach it to the younger generation that have lost their language um, uh, late, uh, before. Mm -hmm. I think I have one more question. So that's 4,000 out of 7. Thousand that are written. Okay. And now, uh, how many languages are endangered today? Hmm. Oh, it sorry. says forty percent. <laughs> sorry, my mistake. Oh yeah. So, sorry, forty percent. Okay, all well, So forty percent of the languages are endangered today. Wow. Um, like uh, according to the UNESCO Atlas of the World Language. Um, so. A few, 3.8% are instinct since 1951, and 96 are critically endangered, and 8.95 severely endangered, and 10.6 um, definitely endangered, and 9.85 about vulnerable. That means that we have to do something to make sure it maintain it. So it's at 3,000 languages today. So when you say, oh, uh, so your question was about whether we should have, so I'm, I'm gonna. So your question was about, um, is it good I do um, have one language? Like right now, English is, you know, the lingua franca of the world. It's used in, in, um, in um, the word of science, the word of business, we use English. And, you know, historically there's been other languages that have been used for the similar purpose too. Like French was used at some point for in Europe, at some point German was used. Um, so it's not a new phenomenon, but it's mm -hmm. a larger scale now because we have internet, we didn't have internet before, and so on. But having one language to, um, so for people to speak one language, if it's as a second language, like right now we teach in school as a second language, that's fine. Right. Mm -hmm. That's fine. And, and it's kind of desirable. It makes, you know, going between country more easy. Right. Yeah. But if your question is about whether we should have it as um, we should have everybody have the same first language. That's it. Right. Um, actually, uh, this is not it's not rea realistic to expect that it will work. First of all, <laughs> no, I don't think anybody will agree to that. You know, which language would you choose? Yes. Actually, languages have made a language called Esperanto that was kind yes. of to be, to be neutral and it never yes. worked out, right? So nobody speaks this. Do you speak Esperanto? No, I don't, but I, I, I know neither. it. So you see, it's yeah, I know of it. Yes. <laughs> it didn't work. It didn't work because, you know, when, it, when the school teach a second language, why did they teach French as a second language? Why do they do that? What do they say? What's the reason? Um, I will say, like, for instance, I, I went to a French school in Colombia. So um, the second language was French. And it was used mainly because of the school was French and to maintain kind of like the idea of and, and, and the, the heritage of the school. Um, and to keep you open-minded and to help you if you wanted to go to France um, to be more creative and the other thing was to open up like as a student 
to open up your horizons later on. It's to open you to other culture, a yes. different way of thinking, different way to expressing yourself. Yes. And, and that's one of the reasons that Esperanto didn't work because it's not associated with any culture. Ah. Whereas, you know, Elvish, <laughs> Klingon, <laughs> it's associated with the culture, even though it's imaginary, yes. it's accepted. And, 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 you know, they teach it at the university. There's the university in the U.S. that I, I saw. <laughs> they teach in Elvish, Elvish classes. And some yes. people are fluent in Elvish and in Klingon because they, um, they like this culture, right? So they want to speak mm -hmm. the language. So speaking, of, so having a language. So if we have one language, we'll have to be a language that is associated with the culture. And if, and by definition, if it's associated with culture, then it's politically, <laughs> it it's difficult. And it's not really. Uh, I think one of the advantage. What's the advantage of that? Uh, beside facilitating communication, but you don't need to be first language for that. But if you force everybody to have the first language, maybe the idea is that everybody would be the same and that it would reduce discrimination across the board. Mm -hmm. But it won't. It won't because it won't change people's skin color. <laughs> yes. It won't change their desires, their beliefs. It won't change their lifestyle. Um, so you cannot, it won't be very useful. And it's not really uh, practical either because, you know, the beauty of a language is that it's different from another, like in the way you can express different things. Mm -hmm. And if you're in that culture, and I can just try to imagine Japanese people just expressing themselves in English. And there's things you can express in English that you cannot with Japanese, but there's many things they can express in Japanese, but you cannot express in English. In English, yes. Hi, I'm very happy to know you are here watching our podcast today. It is an honor to be featuring so many entrepreneurs on the journeys of their inside voice, their accent that is not an accident. And we want to reach out more people like you who are creating a better world of diversity, inclusiveness, equity, and belonging. So please take a moment to hit the subscribe button below, like, and share to others. And if even if you want to leave a comment, that'll be nice. Thank you for your support. And now back to the episode. Yeah, so there's yes. a way of expressing yourself or situation that are different. If you think about, um, you know, kids that are born bilingual and they speak between themselves, they would do what we call code switching. <laughs> yeah, right? My daughter and, does that. <laughs> yeah. And I had a friend, you know, she would talk to me and she would code switch so much. I said, you know, nobody can understand you unless they're bilingual. <laughs> but the thing is that she did that with me because she knew I would understand. Yeah. And code switching, some researchers have found that they don't code switch because they're not fluent enough in one language. It's the opposite because they're so fluent in all the both languages that when they um, want to express an idea and they want exactly to mean that and it's not, they're speaking in French and they know it, they cannot really express it the right way they want in French, they will use the English word. They will code switch to the English, right? And so they will go switch back and forth and it's not, so code switching is not a bad thing. Uh, of course, you have to be able to, if you're speaking with somebody who's monolingual, you have to be able to, not code switch, but between themselves, code switching is actually an interesting phenomenon. And it's, it's, it, it shows how they master the nuance of both mm -hmm. languages so much that they will code switch to really emphasize, to really express themselves really precisely. I love that. That made me feel more like a smarter now. <laughs> <laughs> So if we jump from there to the accents that are not accidents, is it is it even fair? Is it is it right or is it fair or is it I don't know how to formulate is is it good 
to try to get rid of somebody else, somebody's accent? And what are the pros and cons of it? Um, well, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, you can because everybody has an accent. Yes. Even you speak standard North American English accent is still an accent. <laughs> so, it, and there are some accents that are more refer as the norm they're more prestigious somehow, um, but it's still an accent. So you cannot really get rid of your accent. If you want to change your accent, that's maybe the right question. <laughs> yeah. If you want to change your accent, um, well, I mean, if you want, you can. And I know some friends who did. For example, I have friends who were born in Texas and they don't speak Texas accent. And sometimes there's a little something I feel, oh yeah, that was kind of a There it is, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that there, there it was. There was something there. But yeah. you have to know, right? And so for me too, when I speak French to um uh French people from France, I change my accent when I speak to them. I don't know as I speak with my family, just because I know as a linguist that if I reduce some of the vowels I would do in French that they won't understand what it is. And it's not so some people like think, uh, for example, when they go to France, Quebec, Quebec speaker go to France and they say, oh, we do it on purpose, not to understand. And no, they don't do it on purpose, I don't think. I mean, maybe some, but <laughs> I think yeah. the thing is that people pay attention to the intonation. So to figure out which language you speak in, right? So. Uh, yeah, if, I, if I start to speak English a bit like this, uh, if the first sentence I say is uh, which language she's speaking on, right? She yes. this doesn't sound English right away, right? Yes. Uh, and so we listen to the intonation and the intonation first tell us which language to tune in, right? But if you have French Canadian, the intonation is very different than Parisian French. And without having exposure to Quebec French um, people with uh, ear to uh, Parisian French, for example, will, will have a difficulty to pick it up, right? Mm -hmm. And too, some some French dialect, whether it's, it's French in Europe or French in Canada, some French dialect, I have a hard time to pick it up. And at some point, there was some people speaking English, but it was yeah. a dialect of French Canadian, and French Canadian. So, yes. uh, so yeah, it's very hard to. Uh, to uh, uh, so you can change your accent, but now I speak in Mauritius. Uh, most people speak French here, but they speak Mauritian. They also speak uh, kind of a French Creole. And uh, I actually have a really hard time with some speaker here because uh, I think sometimes they blend the Creole with the French. So <laughs> uh, the other day, there's somebody who came here to fix something in the house and uh, he spoke, I believe, in French, but I couldn't really understand anything. So I and I felt really embarrassed to tell him what is and I made him repeat a few times and I tried to ask, Are you speaking French? And I was really embarrassed and I think he said yes. So uh, but I couldn't understand. So I said, How about English? <laughs> 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 what do you what are you saying? So and we, we we ended up talking in English. So some accents are just difficult because you're not used to it. And it's not just Quebec French, it's hard. I went to New Zealand. English in New Zealand was so hard for me because the vowels are all, um, we call it shifted. So there's a shift of vowels. So like the, the uh, sit will sound like seat mm -hmm. and sound like set. Uh, well, there's no set, but that will sound like bet. So all the vowels are shifts. So I couldn't understand yeah. the English in New Zealand, depending on the speaker, of course. Yes. So, so to be fair, um, basically, it, it is really not not something we can do. It's something we can accomplish, and we can change a little bit of our phonetics. But we really are not going to be able to get rid a hundred percent of our accents. Well. And, I think that hmm, I think you can you can, but it's all right. So you can change your accent. I mean, you can make it different, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, but one thing we need to understand is that to have the right accent is not necessary to be intelligible. Mm -hmm. There's some researchers, uh, Monroe and Derwin, who did a lot of research for like, I think 20 years on this to evaluate, okay, if people have an accent, are they more difficult to understand? And they find out that not necessarily, sometimes yes. <laughs> all right, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes yes, but sometimes not at all. So they rated how people rate the accent of somebody like very accented or low accented and how they were easy to understand. Um, like they will transcribe what they are trying to say and see if it was correct, right? And they found out that for some people have really heavy accent but no problem to understand. Mm -hmm. and, and having having an accent, what does that mean? I wanted to have, a, when I learned English, my purpose was to have an accent in English that would be easy understood anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And it seems I've succeeded so far. Yes. People seem to understand. They say I'm easy to understand. Whatever accent I have, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, they understand uh, people usually understand what I'm trying to say, and that's the important for me. And um, accent is not always necessarily uh, bad. Uh, some people love accent. Uh, you know, a little cute accent is like, oh, it's so cute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, and, so. it, and it also is not, um, I don't think it should be used as something to diminish others. Um, to me, somebody that has an accent is somebody that speaks more than one language. So therefore, um, they're probably smarter than the average person. <laughs> and, and usually in today's world, um, if somebody learns another language, you know that they not only speak, they possibly also read and write in that other language, um, you know, it's a great possibility that that is true. So I really don't judge people uh, with access to me. It's fascinating and I, I it, it turns on that curiosity. Where are you from? You know, where are you from? I wanna know about you. <laughs> It's an interesting topic, and it's not always, unfortunately, um, you have heard about uh, racial profiling, right? Mm -hmm. right? Racial profiling is when people discriminate based on your skin color, your race, or your ethnicity, right? But people also use linguistic profiling. So when we listen to a voice, even if it's just on the phone, um, uh, we pick up some information. So whether it's, uh, so when you pick up the phone and your mom is talking to you, you recognize your mom's voice right away. Why? She just say, hey, is that, what do you want, mom? So you recognize her right away. <laughs> Doesn't yeah. have to say much. Uh, so we judge people based on the voice and that can be a problem because you can have, it can lead to discrimination. So you can distinguish people on the, on the phone uh, based on their voice in terms of their age, their gender, um, their social class, how they're feeling, are they half drunk? <laughs> are they, um, <laughs> what, what, what are you, you're drinking again? So, you know, you can recognize on the phone, right? Yes. So there's many things we pick up through the, the, the voice. And one thing we pick up also is the, the same things as we do with racial profiling. And unfortunately, there is, um, there's some discrimination that happens. There's an interesting lady I, I interviewed uh, for my class uh, called Kelly Wright, Dr. Kelly Wright. And she, was, she did a study and she's, uh, she's, um, she's Black, Southern American. So she says she can speak Black English, she can speak Southern English, uh, American English, and she speaks like uh, standard American English, right? Okay. So she did a uh, she did a, some survey. Um, sorry if I don't recall it exactly right. So you can check her paper if you're interested. <laughs> but she she called so she called for uh, visiting a house 
are renting of different areas that are supposedly more for white area and some black area. And she used her three voices. So her black voice, a South American voice, a Southern, yeah, and uh, regular um, standard American voice. And uh, she said that there was some effect that people will just, if she used her black voice, will say, oh, I'm sorry, but it's already rented. Okay. But if she call again with her other voice, it's, oh, yeah, sure, you can visit. That kind of thing. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. It's discriminatory, uh, yes. Yeah, it's discriminatory. And I mean, discrimination occurs everywhere in the world. It happened to me in Japan. It happened to me here in different ways. Uh, it's not necessarily in a bad way, but we discriminate and based on your voice. Um, I don't think that that means we should all change our accent to have a standard British English accent. Or <laughs> so I just think that we have to open people's mind that it's not because you have an accent that um, you necessarily you should you should be condescending toward that person if the person has an accent um, because the assumption when people have an accent there's some research on that that when people have an accent um, like a foreign accent no matter which one uh, they often viewed as uh, less trustworthy yes so we cannot trust them as much because they're foreigner. And that's very sad to have this attitude. And I think this attitude lead to conflicts and problems. And But when this is in place and you have all this going on, how do you fix this? So that's the kind of work I'm interested to do right now. After I, I just I retired from my position to try to investigate these kind of issues and try to find a way to, to help. Uh, because, you know, when you're an immigrant, whether you call yourself an expat or refugee or just an immigrant, uh, you know, you invest a lot. It's a mm -hmm. big, yeah. it, it's hard to move to another country. I mean, you've done it. I've done it like six times. Uh, it's a big investment psychologically, financially, emotionally, and trying to adjust to a new culture. But when immigrants come to new culture, they are at a disadvantage. They don't know the rules. They don't know how they apply. They don't know, you know, the product at the groceries. And we don't have a, so they don't have a head start. They, they're behind. So they, we, they already had the disadvantage. And then we yes. expect them to figure everything out and integrate and become a better citizen than any citizen in the country. Right? So we expect a lot of immigrants, but we don't give them much to go with. Right? So... Yes, yes, you're you're right. And then um, now, after all these expectatives, now we're trying to 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 have uh, immigrants like us um, give up your native language and who you are um, in in order to blend in to uh, the new culture, which is probably now your their home or our home, but still, like for instance, I still speak Spanish in us. Or if, if we go to a restaurant with my family, we speak Spanish. And um, I don't find that offensive at all. I don't, like if I see somebody speaking French or German or um, Japanese, you know, Chinese, I don't find it offending. I just find it that they are with their family and they can speak whatever they want, right? Um, I don't think that we should force anybody to give up on their native language. And, and also, it is, I think that is, is very, um, I will, I, I, I like when parents make the effort to teach their kids their own language, their mother language, on top of where they live. Yeah, as you say, it's not. Uh, I mean, there's been historically there's been some some uh, misconception or beliefs that if you teach the kids two languages at the same time, they're going to get confused and they won't perform very well at school. So they will encourage the parents to don't speak uh, their native language at home. 
And that's actually false. It's not true. Actually, there's a lot of advantage in going bilingual. But also, we need to understand, too, that most of the people in the world today, <laughs> the majority, or grew up at least bilingual or multilingual. So yes. the, the one thing I found fascinating in Mauritius here is that almost everybody speaks like two, three, four, five languages, you know? Yes. And, 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 and they're not incompetent on, on, because of it, you know? It doesn't make them worse at something, at one language. And I think it's the issues that we think that it will affect their language and um, their first language. But it, I mean, there's other benefits for it. Is that yes. if you're, even if, even if it's just opening your mind to different, two different ways of thinking. Because as you said before, a language is also a way of thinking. And if you learn to think in Spanish, being associated with that, right? And if you learn to think in Japanese, it, there's many things associated with that. So you think differently. Exactly. And, and, and that makes you open to the world and to try to um, try to instead of judging people for who they are. I mean, judging is uh, you know we discriminate, and we have to understand that discrimination is a natural way of being a human. Right? Cats do it, dogs do it. We discriminate because it's part of our survival. Right? We're used to distinguish, but. We're not in the wild anymore. <laughs> we have to go against our instinct of discrimination and judging things based on appearance or on what it sounds or what it looks like. So we need to go beyond that. And uh, uh, there's some research that shows that uh, if you teach people to, well, to go abroad, okay, they experience it, not just for travel, but living there is a very different experience, as you know. Traveling is like, oh, it's cool, it's different. <laughs> yes. Two weeks, oh yeah, I'm going to go home. I don't like this, but I'm going to go home. But when you live there, I don't like this, but I have to do this every day. <laughs> yes, yes. There's yes. no way out. Right? So it's very, very different. And, and when you travel, you're basically usually in hotels or even in uh, uh, temporary housing. But when you live in a place, you have to set up the electricity, you have to pay your bills, you have to figure out everything, how it works. Yes. yes. And then in talking about these, I know you're working on something um, that is special to help immigrants in Japan. Yes, that's correct. What is this? Um, yes, okay. So, uh, you know... If you want to travel to another country, there are tons and tons of travel books. We help travelers to travel in other countries and enjoy their experience. Immigrants move to another country or people migrate to another country. Um, and there's very little. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of videos, YouTube videos about Japan uh, explaining how to respect Japanese culture, how to behave, what not. Mostly it's just what not to do. <laughs> yes. Don't lick your chopstick. Don't put your chopstick in your bowl. Don't cut the line. Don't, you know, don't, 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 because you're going to offend the local people. But these things, actually, they're not the most difficult part, I think, of living. And, um, and the thing is, you know, you're told what not to do to offend the local, but what happens if you are offended? Uh huh. Huh? You don't want to harass the local, but what if you are harassed? Yes. So, and you're at disadvantage. You don't know how to do in this culture, right? And how to react. What is accepted? Is it, is it okay, like sexual harassment? Is it normal in this? <laughs> I know. Uh, or power harassment? And can I, should I do this? Or what should I do? Is it, and it's hard to recognize. You know, I've, I've seen some, um, for example, uh, I've seen people married to uh, another, people from another, another culture. And it doesn't matter the culture. The thing is that, you know, there are, um, there is um, abuse in relationships in any culture. Right? Yes. And, and it can happen if you're in a relationship with another culture, someone from another culture. The difficulty is how to recognize that this is not just a cultural difference. 
but it's really abuse and you should get out of it. Okay. So, so there's, um, anyway, so there's a lot of, a lot of things we need to understand. And so I've lived in Japan 13 years and, uh, um, there's been good periods and a harder period, but everything is different. So, so many things are different, but not in the way you think like renting apartment, uh, you have a rental contract. And uh, so how does it work? So I decided to try to make a series of guidebooks. So instead of travel books, it's good books for helping people live in Japan with the little daily things that seems to be easy, but uh, like finding the milk in the <laughs> sweet store. <laughs> I'll, have, I'll have a thing about that because in Japan, if you know, in Japan, if you want to know if it's a, a low low fat milk or a three three or more percent milk, uh, the three percent milk has a dent in it in the uh-huh. carton for blind people. Okay. So if you cannot read Japanese and you see there's a dent, oh, this is three percent. Do I want this or do I want the one without a dent? Right? You choose. <laughs> so there's little tips like this uh, that can help with daily life. And so the first book I'm preparing now is is about renting in Japan, all about renting and setting up your place, the electricity, uh, where to get the furniture you need and so on. Um, And it will be in conjunction with the online list of resources that the list of resources will be free for anybody. The book will be on sale on Amazon and things, but not super expensive because my idea is to help people. And of course it takes a lot of my time and energy to do this. I've I've been working on this for a year and a half just for the first one. And, um, and it's just about renting and there's about 200 pages so far. Awesome. So it's, there's a lot and it's called renting a home. How hard can it be? Well, it's 200 pages long. (laughs) 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 And, uh, I have a lot of pictures and I don't want pictures of, you know, you have travel books and you have all those pictures of wonderful scenery and it's photo up and no i have pictures of course gonna be good pictures but good pictures of real daily things instructions you know japan they love the buttons (laughs) they put buttons everywhere and and, but it's all in japanese you know you try to (laughs) use your washing machine you know you don't have like a just a thing you have like those machine you have like i don't know 15 buttons (laughs) and you don't know how to to fix it up so i have a uh instructions of how to help which button is which so with minimum learning of japanese you can recognize the symbols then you can figure out how to work awesome that is amazing that is amazing you think this guide is going to be very helpful for everybody and we probably need these kind of guides anywhere you move to the world um yeah well i will see so i have the first book is about renting second book will be about something else so maybe uh i want to do about the transportation communication maybe uh eating in eating out like first people have dietary restriction is a nightmare in japan if you have dietary restricting has gluten and everything has uh what is it the other thing you don't uh peanuts maybe not not nuts what's the other allergy oh um dairy there's a lot of dairy and everything and if you have uh, if you don't eat for example meat like vegetarian um almost everything has pork <laughs> <laughs> even even bread will have pork in it pork fat oh, wow. make some bread yeah many bakeries use pork in japan to make their bread so you need you need to ask so it's so i think a book will be really useful especially in japan but i, I wanted um maybe another book about maybe the the visa the legal things about the marriage, divorce, of, of the, the law is changing now, yeah. but I will, um, so what I do is the, the book is more like general guidelines so people understand what it is and then separate it. I have a list of resource. This one I can update. So you can access the list of resource as it is regularly updated and the books just guide you like what you should know, because that's the problem sometimes it's like, well, you're going to figure it out. Yeah. But if you don't know what you need to figure it out, yes. you know? Like in Japan, when you rent an apartment, you have to have a guarantor. And, and you say, oh, guarantor. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, my, my, my brother can be my guarantor or my, my brother. No, 
if you're a foreigner, <laughs> they won't accept that. Uh, they uh -oh. will accept a Japanese citizen that is often a family member. So I was denied because uh, at some point I couldn't rent because I couldn't have a family member that was also a Japanese citizen, right? So if you're married into a Japanese family, you can have the brother-in-law, the parents-in-law, that's fine. Uh, so basically they expect you to have a link with Japan. And, um, but you know, if you don't know, and in and, and the pamphlet of the government, they will say you need a guarantor, but they don't say this specifically. <laughs> So you, you have to figure out by mistake. So the first time I ask a friend who has a good job, been there for a long time, married to a Japanese person, and he said, no, I don't think I will be able to be a guarantor. I said, I, I, I don't mind, but I don't think they will accept me because I'm a foreigner too. And oh, oh, look at that. So it takes you longer if you, if you present the wrong guarantor in but this case. But the thing is that, is, that, yeah, is that you're not prepared right? And then and it's frustrating. It's like, oh, so my book is like to prepare people, <laughs> to prepare people. Like, look, this is what you can expect. And this is what you can do. And sometimes, you know, there's things you can do around, not necessarily bending the rules, but there's some rules, but there's some unwritten rules <laughs> that you can follow, right? And you have to know them, right? Yes. So the book is not so much about culture. It's about really concrete stuff of daily life. Uh, yeah, day-to-day -day stuff, no. Yeah, so there's a lot of books about Japanese culture, and that's fine, that's great, but that's not the purpose. What I think is missing is concrete things for daily life stuff to people to understand how things works and and um, what to expect and what to look out for. Mm -hmm. I love that. So we're heading to the end, and I would like to give you the opportunity to also tell the audience how you how they can find you and how you can help them all right um if somebody wants to move to japan uh, i can offer some sessions to information sessions for people moving to japan um if you're a a, a business <laughs> a business or a school or a um, organization. I also offer a presentation. A presentation. So I'm working on a talk now, uh, probably something entitled like embracing your uniqueness within and across culture. So it's oh. an emphasis on how we have to learn to view people for who they are, their personality, rather than who they, where they come from. Okay. So it's a talk about, a uh, presentation about data to try to uh, raise people awareness and understand how people are. And, you know, when you're in your culture, you think, oh, I'm unique, of course. I'm not like anybody else in my culture. But when you think of somebody in another culture that you don't know anything about that culture, you think they're all the same. Yes. Instinctively, yes. again, discrimination, right? We do this naturally because we need to know what to expect, but we have to go against our instinct to say, okay, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I need to get to know them personally, and then yes. I can see and then my have... judgment. And it's not necessarily a judge that I don't like a person from that culture. It's just that maybe I don't get along with that particular person. It doesn't matter which culture they're mm -hmm. from. Right? So I, I want to do a presentation for that. I also offer a consultation for schools, with their language acquisition program, for example, and uh, intercultural training organization. And uh, so I'm writing this first book, it's gonna be finished soon, and then I'm hoping to start on the second one and see how it goes. Excellent, thank you so much, Dr. Grennan. This was a very informative um, interview. Um, I know that many people are gonna love it, and I will put all the links so that people can find you on the episode notes. Is there a last thought that you would like to leave the audience with? Uh, well, I think that, yeah, I think people should remember that everyone's unique like everybody else. Amen to that. Thank you so much for your time. And to you, my audience, uh, remember, we came to this world because the greatest source of God sent us here with love to be loved 
and love one another. Thank you. Until next time. Bye. Thank you, mate. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Hi, it's Maritza here. If you like this episode of My Accent is No Accident podcast and would like to listen more like this, subscribe wherever you're listening to it or watching it. Leave us a nice review and share with your friends, family, and network. Thanks for listening. I